This is a story of sorts, the podcast mostly about bookish stuff. Hello everyone, Karina here. On the second episode of season two, I've interviewed Eje Gerler. Eje is a writer and an artist. She teaches art tutorials on YouTube and Patreon and is the author of Frank, a middle grade sci-fi book. We talk about her experience writing her debut, the joys and challenges of living abroad, how she started a business in 2020, with a few tips for writers and entrepreneurs alike. Have a listen. So we have AJ here with us. Uh, I already asked how to pronounce the name just to be sure that I was pronouncing it right, which I wasn't, but it's pronounced AJ. It's very nice to have you here. Thank you so much for coming to the podcast. And I usually ask people I invite over to the podcast to write a little bio so that I can get to know them and what they've done. Uh, because there are things I wouldn't find out otherwise. You are Turkish and you moved to the States in 2014. And because I'm an immigrant myself, so I always like to bring people from different backgrounds into the podcasts, uh, into podcast, I would like to ask you, what do you like the least and what do you like the most about the United States? First of all, thank you so much for um, inviting me to your podcast. I love your podcast. I'm very thank happy you. to be a part of it. Um, so good question. <laughs> I think the first, let's start from the worst so that we finish <laughs> on a good line. Um, I think the least favorite thing for me is of course, being away from your own culture that, and your friends and family. I know though, if I go back right now, for example, nothing will be the same either. So it's just kind of this weird dilemma that I'm having all the time sometimes I really really miss you know my childhood friends and you know my family are just like I want my mom <laughs> but you know it just <laughs> doesn't happen but other than that I think I am missing some really long-term friendships in these states because states is really huge and when you think about its size to give you the kind of idea Texas is as big as Turkey so all yeah. my old country <laughs> as big as one state so people travel a lot once they finish uh, university they move and once they get a job they move again and they move again and they move again until they retire they keep I feel like they keep a kind of fluid like they, they're all around the place so you keep losing the friendships that you already had somehow that's what I feel like it's the least favorite of mine that I can't keep a friend here <laughs> Like because for life. them, it's very easy as well to, to move. It's like something they already accept as something they are going to do throughout their lives. In, in, yeah, exactly. In so and in Europe, I have the feeling that people are more like, I'll probably just stay here or around here. <laughs> so it's my, my own support system is here. I'm just going to stay here. <laughs> Yeah, if I I like I live in Boston. I used to live in Chicago and I really love Boston. I I mean, I used to li love Chicago too, but I think Boston has this more European feeling to it. It kind of reminds me home. Uh so everything is in moderation here, which mm -hmm. I really like. So it's not like New York, crazy New York or it's not like <laughs> boring, you know, other states that I don't want to give names so I think uh I think I love where I am right now and I know I'm very comfortable I don't want to move coming to the best thing about the states um I feel like I'm very independent here in Turkey it is hard to for, for example start your own business um I'm an artist and also an author it's very difficult to you know buy supplies that are high quality for for a, you know affordable price mm -hmm. or publishing your own book is a hassle sometimes and you know those kind of independencies and ease and convenience is great in terms of being here and I don't know your culture in <laughs> Portuguese but in Turkey people tend to be a little bit judgmental of um, oh yeah yeah <laughs> what you do yeah <laughs> So in America, I feel like, well, even though they're doing it, they're doing it very well, like secretly. So because I don't feel that way, I can wear anything I want in the street or I can just, you know, freedom of speech is great. Like you can talk on Facebook about your, let's say, president and you don't get jail time for that. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, those kind of things are great. <laughs> and um, what made you decide to stay in the United States? Was it something more specific 
I like United States. I, and I was in between, at some point in my life, around 2016, I was kind of torn between going back or staying. Honestly, neither looked great, nor they looked horrible. So it was a very tough decision for me. <laughs> but, you know, once you have a life somewhere and you kind of have a house, have furniture, have have some connections, then it's very hard to make a big move again. So, and there were other financial reasons that made me stay in the States. And now I look back, I think I made the right decision and staying here because I wouldn't be able to build my own business uh, or write my book this comfortably or this efficiently, I think, if I hadn't stayed. Yeah, so it was a good, a good decision in the end. Yes. Curious because I was also a bit um, torn at some point. Also, when I have a break, I had a breakup, and I kind of considered going back, but I don't think I've ever really considered going back. And I'm really happy that I didn't because I I conquered um, a sort of independence that I also think I wouldn't have conquered if I had gone back. Yeah, right. Independence. Yeah. It comes down to you yeah. and me both. Yeah spending for yourself and then learning to live all by yourself and to do your things it's I wouldn't trade it for any oh. like I really like I live now with my boyfriend I really love it but those years that I lived alone they were still great years yeah of course yeah I totally understand you <laughs> <laughs> great in your bio or through your bio I found out that you have worked as a DJ at a radio station and that sounds like the coolest thing so do you want to talk a little bit about that sure it was an Amazing experience, actually. So it was between 2002 and 2008. I was a DJ at a national radio station in Turkey. We were playing like hot AC. I don't know if you're familiar with radio. Hot AC? No. Yeah. Hot AC. <laughs> so you can have AC, uh, which is adult contemporary. So or hot music, which is like Britney Spears that time. Oh, yeah. Not now, That's... obviously not. I don't know who's even like. I would Dua say Lipa maybe Cardi now? B, for yeah. example, is a Billie hot. Eilish. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but adult contemporary will be Rolling Stones, Deep Purple, you know, those kind of. So you combine those two and you get my radio station, which was uh, interesting because, of course, we are not playing Cardi B there because we were kind of a soft rock kind of radio station. So we would play Avril Lavigne for that time or Pink, which yeah. were like hot, but at the same time, AC kind of <laughs> So I did a uh, regular evening drive time shows, morning office shows. Um, and it, overall, I think I learned a lot about music and people in overall. And you have to be aware of what's happening around you in the world. You have to be up to date. That was great because that was keeping me like, oh, I have to read a newspaper today. I didn't read newspaper today. Uh, so you have to be, you have to have a positive wording, for example, um, the year that I lost my mom, it's just my kind of scripts were a little bit dark. Okay, it may be raining today and we're all like, you know, moody, but we can, we can look at things that positive the way. And then my director came into my studio and says like, AJ, oh. you're very negative. Maybe you should be careful about your wording. I'm like, okay, sorry. <laughs> I didn't notice. Like, it's just, you know, sometimes you're a human being, you know, you have down days and you, you have like positive days. I'm usually a very upbeat person, but so you have to be careful because you, people are listening to you to be happy. So technically that's sometimes the, the, the feelings come out even when you think you've hidden them exactly the words reveal themselves I just <laughs> didn't think that they would but um and of course you have to avoid certain subjects and uh certain topics like politics religion you know try not to you have if you want to give your opinion you have to do it very very smart way that was, was that it. easy did you find it easy to just uh, at the, the time to? <laughs> in the, uh, you mean like the hiding the subjects or? Kind of like not talking about stuff that maybe you would like to talk about, but, but because you have that position in the radio station, you know that you're better off not giving an opinion. I think it was in the beginning it was difficult but once you kind of create your own brand, like people know you and who you are and Actually, I'm a, I believe in humor a lot. I'm, I'm a humorous person. So I would pick a song name, for example, just combining two 
uh, what I just said, and they will understand that I'm talking about a political party. But it, you know, it, it got it made me smarter actually trying to say something without exactly saying it, but yeah. uh, trying to give some hints or jokes or I don't know metaphors yeah. <laughs> to to say what you're saying. I think it was challenging, but it was fun. You know, that kind of tells who your listeners are because they get you. And when you get me, I'm like, you're my best buddy. You like, know who is supporting you as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you took geological engineering degree and then an earth sciences degree. And then you just decided to do something completely unrelated to those degrees. Yeah. What happened there? <laughs> I love science. That's what happened. I, I have always thought I was very good at math and science in high school. I've always thought that's where I belonged. Even when I was studying in college, uh, you know, I was an honor student and I really, really enjoyed studying what I studied. But I also was very creative and always getting involved in projects that required communication, creating something, because I was really good at that. And I, so my left side of my brain and the right side were constantly at war. And finally, my right side won the creativity part because during my master's at the University of Kansas, I realized geology is, was not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. I love it, but I don't love it enough to be married to. It was like <laughs> a love affair for a while um, because, you know, you either have to be in the field or in the lab and, you know, in front of your computer. It's a very lonely job. I felt like where I belong is more I can use my strengths like creativity or communication or helping people. That was what was more attractive to me that that time. So yeah, my path changed drastically. And you were um, teaching English as a second language, which of course comes the the people come yeah. in and that's yeah. interaction with the people. And you became a director of a school in Boston. Can you tell me about that experience? What um, I also have here, what did you enjoy the most and what was the most challenging about it? Oh man, great question. So <laughs> I served international education industry for 11 years. As mm-hmm. I said before, I was creative and really good at communication. So I quit the earth sciences path and started to teach English to international students, combining all the strengths that I just mentioned and you mentioned too. Once I moved to Chicago, Uh, I was promoted to academic coordinator position, which was a little bit more administrative than teaching. Mm -hmm. And I took a job in Boston as a student services manager, which was a high step up. And in the beginning of this year, I took the highest position in a school that you can get. I was a school director at ELS Boston. So what I enjoyed the most uh, was meeting students from all around the world, uh, helping them to realize their dream because they come there to succeed in their careers, succeed in their schoolwork. Because if you want to, for example, improve in science, you have to read papers, more papers, as many papers as possible, and they're all in English. So, you know, that was kind of a milestone for them. And I was really happy to help them in any way that I can. I used to be one of them, so I knew how challenging it was, and I was really happy to help them. The challenging part of the job is you cannot get what you deserve in this industry. So you work really hard, you invest in a lot, you train teachers, admins, you organize events for students, you go out of your way to help them. For example, I used to be on call at the weekends to make sure our students would arrive their residences safely from airport. If a student or one of my employees were frustrated, unhappy, it needed to be taken care of swiftly with uttermost, you know, uh, importance. So, yeah. but all the admins and teachers pay were below national average, except CEOs and vice presidents of private schools. No one in education industry gets paid well. So, yeah. It's something that people have been talking a lot now with COVID because teachers have had to, in so little time, adapt to things Mm -hmm. having classes online etc and yet the pay is always so low like in general for teachers because like when you're a child you kind of say oh I would love to be a teacher but you have this idea that the job stops when everyone goes home but there's so many things that teachers have to do after going home 
that that they have to prepare when they are already not in the school that i i really think it's must be such a difficult job yes and you know i think i don't know what you think but a lot of people if you ask anyone anyone in the street tell me about you know your favorite doctor or you know your favorite supermarket owner they wouldn't say a name easily but if you ask what well, who was your favorite teacher they're going to yeah. tell you right away because teachers play a very important role in our lives like they they are a part of our growing up and uh, how we shape our personalities and they're getting paid so little i just like i really wanted this to change education is not given importance in anywhere in this world in even most developed countries and i don't still understand why yeah because they basically when the kids are not at home they're doing the job of the parents and more because the education is not just learning to write and and do maths and etc the education is is also to make them good citizens to go out in into the world and so many people whose life kind of changes because a teacher trusted them i i've read this um now that i think about it i read this book by jakira diaz it's called ordinary girls and she talks about it about how one teacher basically just changed their whole life that could have gone a really bad path and um, they're so important yeah. i think agreed 100 mm -hmm. so and with covid you had to stop with the lessons and you decided that it was Uh, the best time to focus on something that you also love doing and and you decided to create a business a way to live from that as well mm -hmm. were yeah, you that... uh, sorry were you an artistic child is this something that comes <laughs> or something that you developed with time <laughs> yes I think uh let me tell you very quickly how this COVID changed everything uh so I do adjust well to the corporate world But I have always wanted to work for myself, not for someone else, because mm -hmm. all that hard work, all the creative and smart ideas you come up with would go unnoticed or unappreciated most of the time. And it will be so hard to make a change for the better in your workplace, uh, unless you're at the very high top in the in the administration. So I think that was always on somewhere in my mind. And when I was furloughed, I thought to myself, this is my moment. I can start my own business and create a business plan, take the first steps and see how it goes. Um, so I started my art business and finally uh, found a publisher for my book. And now I love being my own boss. Coming to your question about art, being an artistic child, I was an artistic child. My family used to tell me at the age of three, people wouldn't believe my paintings were done by a three-year-old. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I wasn't obviously a Da Vinci, but... Um, I was somehow above average in that sense. In middle school art class, my friends always would ask for my help. So teachers would understand, AJ, did you help your friends again? <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm exactly painting the same things like a copy machine. <laughs> so, um, but that was, uh, um, so I was, but then after high school, I started to have less and less time for art. I was still being creative in other ways, like writing a script for a radio program, or making fun and creative gifts for my family and friends, but that was it. So it was 2017 when I finally stopped running and got more financially independent. Mm -hmm. I also fell in love. So oh. I had a very caring <laughs> and loving relationship, which you can feel more peaceful in it. So that was the time I finally could focus on my book and start writing again. And I could finally start thinking about more my art. Also, I started my personal blog the same year and uh, making sketches at Starbucks, trying to improve my drawing skills on YouTube. So when the pandemic hit, I said, I will teach what I know to people who are interested because I have so much time in my hands now. Uh, yeah. So I created YouTube channel, Instagram, and my Patreon account to promote my art tutorials, helping artists to improve their art, just like me. Just so like you were already busy doing art a few years back when basically you had like more the mental space and uh, to uh, to start again. But this year you kind of went further in it with uh, with it with Patreon and YouTube, etc. Yeah, and I was like spending more time on my art because even though three years ago I started, it was maybe once a month I was just drawing 
a realistic portrait and improving my skills. Huh, you know, let me try this different medium here and yeah. it's working or not. But this year I am doing at least two artwork a week. So it's just much more speeded up and <laughs> requires more patience. Let me say that way. And so. COVID did not stop your creativity. You just no, it right. actually That's great. improved. I don't know why I think I'll tell you in the next questions, yeah. but I think <laughs> it improved me more. That's great. And um, did you bump into a lot of difficulties? Uh, was it a big investment um, or something that just sort of happen happened with the business? It wasn't a huge investment in the beginning. I mean, technically you are doing art at home, so you have to only buy, you know, the supplies. But as it grew, it required more and more, especially in marketing and promotion side, mm -hmm. um, more investment. So you do these good artwork, but the internet is oversaturated. You cannot get seen unless you run promotional campaigns mm -hmm. and ads. So of course, there were some difficulties. For example, I used to film my tutorials with my iPhone. I would run out of space and it would stop recording without me noticing. Oh, so that that's... seven hour tutorial would go in waste. <laughs> So. Yeah, that, that's a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, to start exactly. it all over. Yeah, um, and I, I, it was terrible. Then storage of my videos on my PC became a problem because my PC was slow, didn't have enough space, and my one video was like 28 gigabytes. So it would wow. take a lot of space. So I had yeah. to buy extra space. I never thought about this before. And finally, I think... The, the, the problem I came across is I run two separate businesses, like one uh, for Turkey and one for English channel. So they are very different culturally. Um, so the marketing and promotion changes, they, what they like, what they don't like in terms of art is very different. So um, the cultural differences made my promotion work very tricky. So that yeah. sounds also like a lot of work to have to do. Two like, of them? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm not going to lie because <laughs> sometimes i think like also with podcasts some people have podcasts in two languages so they have like two podcasts and there must be so much work as well to have to record one and then the other and kind of fit it to different the market voiceovers. And... yep yep instagram's two different instagrams i'm running wow. there too every post needs to be in two languages it's it's definitely a challenging one are and you like good it. at at like staying away from the internet and scheduling what you have to do throughout the day so that you don't waste a lot of time and you have time to do everything because yeah two instagram accounts as well good question here is the challenge i am good at time management i know exactly what i'm gonna post when i'm gonna post but even though i tried so many times like writing on a piece of paper okay monday 11 a.m post this like it never happens so I'm being more realistic now. I'm working more like this needs to be get done by Wednesday, for example. I have more like deadline work now. It works better for me. But at the same time, because this is your own business, because you're not working for someone else but yourself, sometimes your hours kind of get really like intervene each other. Like, I don't know what time I'm going to bed. I found myself working till 2 a.m. last night. And why? Like, if I was working for in a company, I would stop at 5 p.m. and just I can't stop. I because I always think I always think that I can do more. I can do more beautiful posts. I can make more challenging, uh, let's say, competitions or giveaways. Like I'm always researching too what others are doing, what my rivals are doing, right? Yeah. The, what other art channels are doing. So I have to always keep like working on these things. So although I do things on time and they're not burning me out yet, I feel like I'm work overworking, to be honest. But so. it's also something that maybe sometimes you lose track of time because you love it so much. Yeah. And it brings you joy as well. Although, yeah, a lot of things that bring people joy can become a bit overwhelming with time. Yeah. But... And Exactly. And I think it's still the beginning. I started my business in June. Mm -hmm. So it's still very new. Um, I think once a year or two years passes, I think I will have more things in place. Yeah. I don't have to work this hard, maybe, but <laughs> you never know. <laughs> this is yeah. me, you know. <laughs> well, it's just the beginning of the business, baby. Who knows? Maybe um, uh, next year will be more than just you. Maybe. <laughs> some support there <laughs> and did you have 
something to fall back um, to in case it this failed with the Patreon and the lessons, or was it basically a all or nothing kind of thing? Because maybe there wasn't like too too much to lose anymore. Mm -hmm. I you had know, nothing like, to lose. Yeah, because if if you get, I know a lot of people who, for example, got laid off this year and they just decided to go into something else. So I think yeah, pandemic created such an interesting opportunity for people I know it's been really really hard on a lot of people I was just one of the lucky ones that my boyfriend still has a job and you know we can pay our mortgage so that's good but at the same time I'm very real you know aware of the fact that um, this moment was something that I was looking for for in a very long time because I finally have time to focus on what I'm doing and I had the opportunity in terms of like uh, cost of things because I had some savings so you know it wasn't terrible for me but I understand for other people who are going through challenging times and they still don't have time especially if you have a kid at home <laughs> it's a different story oh, right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time I'm also in favor of using the opportunity as it comes to you. I saw this as an opportunity instead of sitting at home and like looking for other jobs or trying to be feeling sorry for myself. I just saw that, you know what? I was looking for some break from my work and to focus on something that I always wanted to do. So give it a shot. I'm going to give it a shot. And as I said, it's not a big investment because in the past, I was thinking about opening my own science STEM school, mm -hmm. actually STEAM school with art. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, that's a lot of investment. You have to rent a place. You have to buy furniture. You have to hire teachers. That was a lot of investment. And if it goes into waste, then you lose a lot. But with art from home, I'm you know, I had nothing to lose, but also I knew I would succeed somehow. I had never, Karina, I, I never felt this certain in my life about any other job. I still know that my business will get much bigger and I have a feeling that I'm on the right path. I never had this certain feeling. I'm a Capricorn. I don't know if you believe in astrology. I'm but... a Capricorn too. <laughs> yeah. We're always suspicious Wait, about things. What's we... your birthday? Now I need to ask. Christmas. Oh, 25th? Yeah, uh, I'm the 5th of January. So oh, okay. That's great. <laughs> so I don't know if you agree that but we always question things we always suspicious, we are suspicious. Of, what if this doesn't work plan B plan C like, that's yeah. how my mind works. I want to be certain of things. I always have this like, maybe it doesn't work, maybe but for this job for this art business and my writing business, I have a feeling that I will succeed. I, I, I have this feeling. So I was thinking, if I do a plan B in case it failed, if, it's, if I start a business with plans in case of a possible failure, I feel like I'd never succeed. So you would just set yourself to failure by having a plan B? Uh, yeah. For so this it, one, yeah. for this one, that's how I felt. For, for an entrepreneur, that's how I felt. Yeah. So I didn't do any plan B. I was like, if it fails, it fails. Oh, 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 then bad. I think something up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what can I do? Then I'm going to use my paintings like around my house I'm gonna hang them <laughs> enjoy myself <laughs> but yeah yeah because the, I mean artists that's the thing you nobody can take away the joy that you get from making it even yeah. if it then turns out that it it doesn't sell so yeah same thing with my book too you know it just it's out there now if people don't like it I mean which is very true because even my favorite books some people don't like them so oh, that's yeah. possible but I put it out there. It's mine. And that's what I cared for mostly in the creative business. Yeah, especially because and with art in general, I think people never look at something and they never read a book by the book itself. Everybody reads the book differently. Exactly. And for some people, that book means a lot for others doesn't. But it's not it's personal to the person who reads it, not to the author. So exactly. And um, did it take you still in the business um, side? Like, did it take you uh, some time to get profit or some sales in the lessons in Patreon? Of course. Well, it's a slow business. So I have no idea. Business. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'm in asking order... so that people who yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe are feeling a bit, uh, you know, let down. 
can have course. an idea. Please don't feel let down, guys, because in order to get customers, for example, on Patreon, you have to get an audience first and build mm-hmm. trust. So you should show, for example, for this trust building uh, process, you should show, for example, consistency in your work in terms of quality and frequency. For example, if I post a video today and then for two weeks you don't hear from me, you're going to get this feeling from me that, oh, you know, she's not very uh, regular or she's not consistent in her work. Um, or my quality, if it gets kind of dropped in time, then you're going to feel like, oh, I'm not, I don't want to invest my money into something that I don't trust. So my YouTube, my Instagram and Facebook accounts have been creating this audience space for me since June. And I have just recently actually started to make profit from my Patreon, um, frankly. It is a long haul. Maybe six, five months have been. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a long haul, as I said, and I heard that it is not realistic to plan on profit before one year. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm on the right track and it makes sense, especially I'm thinking about getting some YouTube ads as well, like commission from the YouTube ads. And it takes a certain amount of watch hours and subscribers in order to get that base. Again, it takes at least a year or a year and a half. So you are just stay in, don't give up and keep up your quality, consistency, uh, frequency, like, you know, whatever you set up from the very beginning, just don't give up. I know it's very difficult because you've been doing, doing, doing things and you're not getting anything in return, but it's going to pay off later. Trust me. That's great advice. Just keep doing what you love and then eventually people will love what you do. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> uh, I had your question about any tips or advice um, for people who want to start a business and you know are a bit lost in life and don't know exactly um, how to turn their passion into work or how to just turn their passion into something they can do more often. Um, do you have any tips on that besides what you already, what you already said? Mm-hmm. Of course, I'm not an expert, but I want to share my experience and what I see around me. So I would say, listen to what your heart is saying and what your mind secretly wants. Do not listen to others who feed your fear of starting. Many people, including friends and family, will reflect their own fears onto you. If there's something in you that really wants to start something, but you don't know where to start, just start small and start somehow, start today. For example, let's say you have been wanting to write a book. I hear a lot from my friends. Oh, I want to write a book too, but never had the time to sit down and start. For example, give only 30 minutes to yourself that day instead of watching Netflix, for example, sit down with a piece of paper and brainstorm. Create a mind map. What do you like writing about? Fiction, nonfiction? What audience do you want to write for? Adults or children? Do you like romance? If so, what kind? What kind of characters do you like? Do you like the present setting, future or past? Once you write these down, 30 minutes will already pass. Congrats, you started. So, you know, once you start, (laughs) I think uh, you can't stop. That's how I am. Like once I start, the door opens and then the flood comes in. So it keeps coming. If you want to turn your hobby into a business, though it's a little bit different story because you need to learn business stuff. So hobby is different and business is different a little bit. Business stuff, including accounting, marketing, the tricks of creating social media posts, uh, advertisements, reading the analytics of your page, web web page creation. You need to have a web page, building your email list, all kinds of stuff that definitely you need to learn besides your creative part of work, but it is easy to learn. It's all out there for free yeah. for you guys. Like there are so many blogs, so many YouTube videos about how to start your own business. Definitely. If you want to do it, just don't find excuses and start today. That's the- it, it can take time, but I kind of have the feeling that much of the, um, the work of researching, it's already done. In one, exactly. in sometimes in one place, we are in a very lucky time, I think. Yeah, because 10 years or 20 years from before, like today, I think there people didn't have this chance to go on YouTube and uh, listen to success stories or or failure stories from people so that they wouldn't do this, make the same mistakes, or you know, they would get this advice from these people. But now we have 
an endless <laughs> resource yeah. that we can actually go in and see what worked and what didn't for other people. So I think we should take really good use of this and search for it. But I think it's all about time management. You have to just get started and keep doing it every day, piece by piece, consistently. That's it. Yeah. And like, there's something that I noticed that when I see your videos and stories on Instagram, you seem always so happy to be doing what you're doing. And there is so much joy in those posts. It's one of the things that kind of came out to me more, like when I was uh, checking your profile and stuff. And is this something that is intrinsic to your personality or is it specifically when you're doing art and when you're creating? <laughs> Actually, I think it's both. I'm generally a happy person. I get stressed out, of course, time to time, but I love yeah. life and I love people. So I think that affects me. But of course, loving what I do and the way I want to do, I'm, I'm just working the way I want it to finally has an extra positive impact on me. So I think it's a combination of what I do and how my personality is. Also, when I'm watching my videos, I find myself smiling too. So I think that's working. Maybe this radio uh, training that I got in the past helps me as well. Be always positive because, you know, you go and I don't know, have a bad, bad news that day, but I have to film an intro. Yeah. I have to still put a smile face. Mm -hmm. It's not faking, but at the same time. Uh, you're kind of forcing yourself to forget what you just heard and focus on your audience because your audience doesn't have to go through what you're going through. Think about this. You are one person and I have 2000 subscribers on my Turkish channel. If everyone watches that video, I'm going to make 2000 people unhappy. They don't deserve this. No. So, <laughs> I know. So I think they deserve a happy person smiling at them and giving them the art needs that they want uh, during that 50 minute video. And that's what I'm doing. So that's really great. Like, that's a great way to think of it. <laughs> uh, you said that uh, you always wanted to write a book and for uh, this book, because that's the reason why we're here. It's because you wrote Frank and you decided to write the book and you illustrated the book as well and it's finally out there so tell us a bit about the book what is it about and for which age more or less okay if i go like too much ahead just let me know <laughs> because <laughs> no when just... i'm talking about my book i might just like i lose myself a little bit and talk no too worries much. just of course just speak your heart thank you my book title is frank as you said Uh, Frank is a sci-fi book for middle grade readers. Middle grade meaning in America, aging seven to 12. The story of Frank is an interesting one. Frank is a gifted child with specific interest in science, but he has trouble making friends, a little bit socially awkward. One day he accidentally learns that he's adopted and with how like 10 11 year old feels he feels hurt and he goes into his closet which is a big closet full of everything he loves with anger and frustration he kind of throws his tablet at the wall and suddenly this hole appears in the wallpaper what happens though afterwards is basically he finds a tunnel and at the end of this tunnel he meets andy and andy is Frank's age, they become friends. And finally, that wall comes down and they meet in person, Frank and Andy. What happens afterwards, though, Frank realizes that Andy's house is the exact replica of Frank's, but everything is so different. They finally realize the reason they belong to different universes. They complete each other. Frank and Andy are opposite characters. Frank is a science kid. Um, and Andy has a cheerful personality, nothing to do with science, but he easily makes friends and, you know, he finds his way. He's a great, he's um, also great at reading social cues. So in the end, they decide to go on a journey together to find Frank's biological parents in Andy's universe, because in Frank's mind, child mind, of course, like if my parents didn't want me in my universe, 
maybe they will want me in Andy's universe. So they go on this adventure in Andy's universe, but there are so many situations, dangerous situations that they have to uh, overcome. And finally, of course, I'm not going to tell you what happens in the end. So (laughs) (laughs) So the whole actually journey is about friendship, family, and also some other issues that people don't want to talk in general, how we can overcome these issues. And in the end, there's always, you know, something positive can happen. I wanted to encourage children. I want to encourage children in terms of science, in terms of family relationships and friendships. So I think uh, that's the story of Frank. It's there's one thing like there's many things, but like there's one specific thing that I thought super cool when I read the book. Because I'm obviously not a child, mm-hmm. but I like children's books still. And I kind of thought if I was like I started reading at about when I was about nine ten, and I thought if I had picked up this book when I was a child, there's so much information here that I would just love to tell adults that I know like you know that someone would say something and I'm like oh yeah I know that because and then like the book would be such a great source of information of learning things because there are so many facts in there that you learn like I I'm I'm terrible at maths I'm like I'm on the language side I as soon as someone says a number to me my brain just shuts down (laughs) so I'm terrible at maths but I loved uh, when I read a book and they had this information and there are things that I still remember to this day that I read when I was 11 about nature and and other other stuff like that, that I think this book has so many of those little things that must be such a joy for kids to be reading it and being, they're reading this adventure story and they're learning these facts that it's just amazing. I'm so, so happy to hear that, Karina, because, you know, that was my, one of my purposes to write this book in a fun way, in the fun moment of these two friends, just, you know, putting that scientific fact there, how Frank thinks about that scientific fact and uses it. It just makes it more fun. It makes it like, even look, I just wanted to make science look cool. And yeah. I think what you're saying is like, I succeeded in that. Thank you. I think, I mean, like I said, I'm not a child, but my, my 10 year old would be really pumped up to read all those things and to learn all those things into the story and then just go and, and just put it into conversations. Oh, thank you. (laughs) With other people. So that was, that was really cool. Um, I'm so happy. This is um, a question that it may be a bit difficult to reply to, but how did the idea to write Frank come about and what inspired you to write this specific uh, story do you remember like a place or a time or did the story just come to you bit by bit and you have no idea where it came from now yes I remember so vividly um it was winter time in 2017 I think it was November I'm not sure I was at a bus stop and it was snowing that day in Boston I was sitting at the bus stop waiting for my boss I had been thinking about writing a book and writing a good story, but I just didn't know where to start. Even I was not sure about the audience. Do I want to write for adults? Do I want to write for kids? But suddenly when I was sitting at the bus stop, I just saw Frank in my mind, very clear, like this red hair, red giant red glasses with freckles. And he's like 10, he's very short, but 10 or 11 years old I couldn't tell the age right away but he was smiling at me and he was just like you know correcting her his glasses <laughs> and I was like oh he's my character I found my character okay and he's a science nerd that's how it came to my mind right then and there and his name also appeared right away Frank so if some people ask me why didn't you choose a female character or you know a person of color which is a very which which are very good questions Mm -hmm. and I really don't have as a creator I don't have a very good answer to that I'm not forcing myself to create a character it just happened to be there and it was just frank and I really wanted to go with that because it's the magic of your writing the character comes to you and says like okay I'm waiting write about me you know so that's how I felt like frank was talking to me I was like hey 
I know now you have me write about me. So I went to Starbucks the same day. I love coffee, by the way. Um, and <laughs> I went to um, on a table and just wrote maybe four or five hours straight till Starbucks closed. It was there, my story. Andy came later. And once I have Frank and Andy met, I knew the ending, but I didn't know how to get to that ending. Oh, that's always the worst, isn't it? I always find that, like, I like write fiction uh, to write fiction as well. I haven't written fiction in a very long time. But for me, it's you have points in your story that you know you want to include. And those are like high points in the story. But the trouble is, how do I find the little bits of information that I have to put in? Because this is a book. It's not a story I'm telling my friends. How do I get those bits of information that like the bridges that will connect all those major points to each other. That's exactly. terrible. Exactly. That was very interesting for me. Yeah. Was it tough to, to kind of come up with all the rest? And it, uh, yes, I think difficult. It was difficult because of the consistency in the world that you create. And it was just getting there with the same consistency and also creating all these ups and downs but then finally connecting them to where you want to connect yeah it's tough i think did you write uh like those major points and then you went back to the rest or did you do like like the timeline of the book you started in one point and then you knew the end but you wrote the middle all you know like bit by bit yeah i think so when they start the journey, Andy and Frank, till what happened in the end, those required a few scenes that different stories, uh, mm -hmm. bits of stories. Those were, I was thinking about what's next? What can I do next? Where they can go next? What kind of situations they can face next? So that I made a list, yes. Um, and I wanted to give them a realistic order because it cannot, then if you, if you do them too often or if you do them like too apart, then it's not going to look realistic or it might bore the reader. Mm -hmm. But also I love twists. So all these twists need to be there for me. And I was trying to decide where to put those twists in what kind of uh, pace. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, those the journey part, I definitely wrote down to, to the steps. One thing I want to tell you, I don't know if you agree with me, most authors probably would agree with me that the worst part of your book, the most difficult, I think, part of your book is the ending because you get really, I think in the climax part, you get really high and then suddenly you, it's like sugar rush. You feel really tired and you want to finish. So you just come to the ending of your book and you suddenly start rushing. So I realized that in me and I went back and I unrushed myself I don't know if that's a word but I, I think that's a potential danger in every writer because okay it's like it's like doing the art too if you if you paint or you draw the face of the portrait you did such a great job the realistic portrait the hair and the eyes and the nose when it comes to clothing part you're so burnt out or you just want to finish you yeah. just like you rush through it and you 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 kind of um, suffer during the clothing part. So I felt the same way in the ending because I wanted to have a perfect ending because ending is so important. It's like a TV show, a TV series, a movie. Ending is so important. Yeah. People were like, oh, that was a terrible book if the ending is terrible. Because it wraps up every, yeah, it wraps everything up together. And uh, yeah. of course, <laughs> it, nobody wants to get uh, disappointed either. I know, exactly. So that was tough on me. I need to go back and it's like, AJ, don't rush, okay? You're writing the ending again. So that's how I kind of had to... Did you ever felt through the process that you had these ideas, but the way that kind of the characters and the characters and the story becomes alive, you are losing that. You are going into another track that is, is not the track you are trying to go to. And then you find it hard to get back on track to where you want it to be. Because I, mm -hmm. I kind of have the feeling that sometimes you have, again, key scenes, but your writing isn't helping you to get to that key scene. Yeah, um, I know what you're saying. Yes, because it's very interesting. It's like organic. These characters kind of evolve in the story themselves. 
So they create this um, characters themselves. And as you know, more as a writer, what if you ask me, for example, what Frank likes to eat or drink, I would tell you right away because then you get to very familiar with your characters as your book evolves. But then you want to come to that key point, but then it's like, hmm, Frank wouldn't go there. Or like, <laughs> I say like, oh, Andy, Andy would laugh at him here. Like it wouldn't work as scary as I wanted to, or, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, so it's just, um, you're right. I, I think it's some key scenes I kind of didn't do. I picked, I, I was going to add more actually. And then I realized that it had to be during the one day period. And instead of like, days or weeks mm -hmm. those kind of things that I you had to make decisions as you go okay I decided on this scene but it's not gonna fit my characters anymore or it's not gonna fit my timeline anymore yeah. so I'm just gonna put in trash you <laughs> have to be able to let it go I think that's another yeah. challenge for writers that it's hard to let it go because you yeah. thought about it and you think it's really cool but if it doesn't fit it doesn't fit what can we do yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's one of the things that you wrote, even if you write something, and then you know that doesn't work with the rest of the text, but you don't want to take it apart, you don't want to tear it down there because you wrote it and you really like that, but it completely ruins the whole text. So you just, yeah, that's true. You gotta let it go. <laughs> Talk of process to learn. Uh, and did you have a schedule? Or did you write as inspiration came about? which maybe this is a bit of a silly question for me to, to ask because most writers do say, yeah, you can't wait for inspiration. You just have to sit down and, and make it come to you. But how did, how did it work? Because you, uh, how long did it, took you, did it take you to write the, the book? I think it was I, 2017, November, when, the, when Frank talked to me. Yeah. Uh, I think 2018, March, I mm -hmm. had finished it. So to five months. I, every morning, four to five hours, I used to work in the evenings then, uh, 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. in a mm -hmm. school. So every morning, five hours, I would work on my book and every weekend, seven hours per day, probably. Wow, that's full time. That's the full time one. Yeah. And I couldn't stop. It was so much fun. I felt like writing my book felt like I was reading a book, but in a more fun way because I was creating it. So I couldn't stop. That was the moment that I just kept writing. And I, that was great. I don't know if I'm going to have that moment again. Honestly, I'm mm -hmm. working on my second uh, book ideas right now. I have two, wow. but then I don't have the same energy or I would say time to mm -hmm. dedicate right now. So we will see how it goes. I guess we'll talk about it when they're out. <laughs> <Again>. <laughs> <laughs> just putting great. it out there. <laughs> yeah, sure. I would love it. <laughs> and um, without spoilers or without a lot of spoilers, uh, what was your favorite scene to write? Well, difficult without giving spoilers here. Uh, no, no, no. I, I don't mind, really. <laughs> I think the section that Andy and Frank meet Ada in the forest village, mm -hmm. I, I could write a whole book about Ada. I liked her so much. I think that was one fun scene. Also... There was a conversation at the tree house when Andy and Frank were watching the stars. Mm -hmm. That scene, that conversation has a special place in my heart. So I think I enjoyed it a lot. See, there isn't a lot of uh, spoilers. Now people, of course, yeah. now people to understand they will have to read it, but that's the point. <laughs> that's the point. <laughs> what did you find the hardest about writing this book? Where to start? <laughs> so I... I'm a, not a native English speaker, as you can tell. So writing... Not at, really, to be honest. But... <laughs> Thank you. But I mean, to be honest, when you are writing, the story is there and it comes to you in, in like a movie or in pictures and you're writing it down. I had a very difficult time in explaining gestures because how do you explain this? Like, you know, specific like... You're going to have to do it because people can't see you. Yeah, I, I can see you, but they can't. See, I can still explain. <laughs> so your, your hands are on your hips and you're just like, you know, looking frustrated, but you don't want to say frustrated. You want to show, show, not tell. Yeah. So I, I just want to, I, I really improved myself in that. I know all the gestures now I can <laughs> tell you, but that was difficult. But at the same time, 
except me as an author in general, I think there are main difficulties such as creating believable characters because you're writing about an 11 years old. You are not, I was 27 years, it's been 27 years, I was 11 years old and I was never a guy. So I don't know honestly how to write from an 11 years old year old's mind. So you have to do a lot of research and observation. Mm -hmm. You have to read other uh, middle grade books or you have to observe your friends, children, um, you know, or children around you to see what they would actually think in that part or of the life or what they wouldn't. You know, this was an interesting research for me. Another one is uh, POV, the point of view, deciding Mm -hmm. on the point of view. I think it's so important. Who's going to tell your story? If Frank tells you the story, would that be more effective? Or if some outsider would tell the story as a whole, would that be more effective? And think about this. A child will read this. How much, because adult and child is different in terms Mm -hmm. of, again, which one would create a greater impact in in terms of point of view. So that was challenging because if it's, for example, Andy's point of view, how come he knows how Frank is feeling? Because he was like, Frank was frustrated. Okay, how come Andy knows Frank was frustrated? You know, those kind of things that you have to really think about. That was challenging. (laughs) What do you want to focus on as well? If you want to tell everything or if you want to point to focus on the point of view of one character in specific. Exactly. Is there anything that you consider was the easiest part of writing the book? If there is an easiest part at all. Yeah, yeah. I think the most thing that the, the thing is, if you're a reader, if you like to read, I think it's easy to get lost in the story and end up writing pages and pages. That's how I was working, as I said, seven hours. So once you create the scene in your head, it is easy to put it down on paper. I think it's more difficult to go back and edit those uh, story in a more uh, believable, more realistic way. Because if you're reading a lot in your free time, especially fiction, you kind of have already this interesting pathway in your brain that you know how it goes oh I need twists or I need uh, a cliffhanger at the end of the chapter or I need um, a character development in the very beginning oh I have to grab attention of the reader in the first 10 pages if you know these things already because you read a lot then it just comes easy but what comes to difficult part as I mentioned before writing this in a more believable way and more mm-hmm. consistent way I think And what is your goal with Frank? Like, what do you expect to achieve? And this is a very broad question. So it can be in terms of personal satisfaction, professional, monetary. What do you what do you want to reach or to do with Frank? So every author, so our books are our babies, right? So every author wants to be the bestseller. Every Mm -hmm. author wants to be J.K. Rowling or, you know, um, Uh No, so. I mean, not, not personally. <laughs> and not as a person. Just to put it out there, <laughs> just to make sure people know that. Uh, <laughs> not not my person. No. Uh, I, mean, I meant bestseller. No, not I understood. <laughs> so I'm being very realistic. It takes time for a book to become bestseller unless you have strong connections. So it's marketing and promotion takes months, if not years. Yeah. So think about it. You buy a book from bookstore. That's how I am but I still have to finish what I'm currently reading. Three months later, I start Frank, but life happens and I can't finish it right away. Two months later, I'm done with the book. I really like it, but I don't do anything about it, even though I really like it. A few months later, my nephew's birthday comes and I remember Frank was a great book. So I give it to him. Do you see how slowly it progresses? Not to mention that the things that we actually reach out uh, reach to uh in bookstores they all depend on publishing because most people i have the feeling that a lot of people think that what you read is just a coincidence that kind of the book shows you at the bookstore or something but it's not because if you go to a lot of bookstores or even the library things are put in a certain way for you to pick certain books yeah i know so it's 
So yeah, you, you, I definitely want to be successful. Of course, I want people to like my book and, uh, you know, get the message that I'm trying to give there and like Frank and Andy as much as I like, but I am also, I'm not doing the book publishing for financial reasons, to be honest. None of the writers, I think, I don't believe any authors start writing books to make money. I think writing books is just to put your story out there and, mm -hmm. you, you know, use your creativity. It's just like an urge. Like I need to give this story to people and then you just give it to people and then you already think about, oh, okay, I'm not going to make money out of this, but let's see what happens. Every author has a part-time job anyway, or a full-time job. So, and it's um, out of your hands once it's out in the world. Yeah. It's, it's theirs, like whatever they make out of it, but also a book is evergreen. It's not something that you consume and you just burn it, right? Yeah. It's just, it's there on your shelf or you give it to someone else and then give it to someone else. That's what I like about books. It's, it's always there and somebody is reading it and somehow your message will come across to someone. I think that's a great part of um, writing a book. But I want to mention, I think it can be a really good Hollywood movie. So if any producers listening to us, I suggest they have a look at Frank's story. Yeah, because... Look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually, yeah, a lot of the scenes there. And it's curious because I think the story comes very much alive because of the illustrations because you chose the illustration that you chose to to make for it they're very colorful so they really you know like they come alive in the story like even the if you see the cover and the the colors and everything so yeah i think if it was a movie yeah it would just yeah it would just leave <laughs> i just, uh, thank you so much alive. i also want to mention that um it's not colorful in the print book oh yeah that's true because yeah. i got um but ebook digital... has ebook has the yeah, colors unfortunately i wanted to do the print ones with colors but they said that probably you would lose money if you <laughs> and um you know it's 16 pages of i think colored yeah. illustrations made by me and also um someone else that I hired can digitalize it for me mm -hmm. so that was great um but yeah you, they are, you, sorry yeah. you do everything on paper I did everything on paper uh and like I drew my art and I sent I took pictures of it and I sent it to um jo uh, Uhala it's uh, who I hired she's great I highly recommend her if you're looking for a digitalizing um, artist so she took those and she makes make them more I would say professional looking because mine was like colored pencils and ink yeah I mean it would look original probably but I wanted it to look more professional than original mm -hmm. to be honest so that's how it came alive yeah because I ask because a lot of um, illustrators uh do do a lot of illustration um, on paper and then they use like an app or something on ipad or whatever device they use to digitalize it but a lot of people also immediately draw on the um, on, on a digital surface so that's why i um i wanted just to to make it clear if it was really uh, an illustration that you made on paper or if you immediately did it um, digital but it was on paper and then was digitalized later. Yeah, no, I, I put on paper. Actually, I'm going to show you after this <laughs> and you can see, but nobody can see. So <laughs> No, I can I can share it on uh, Instagram or Twitter because uh, the I have um, the oh. social media for the podcast and I can always do that when the, the podcast comes out. No problem. Awesome. That would be great, actually. Then okay. I can sure. also um, link to the, the illustrate to the person who, who digitalized in case someone is looking for it. Because, yeah, the illustrations, like I said, in the digitalized, I really like books in print, but the digitalized version is is uh, really cute with the illustrations in yeah in the middle with uh, with color so it's yeah. really cool and Thank it's you. really cool that you just did everything like both the, the drawings and the writing Thank you. that's really nice <laughs> one last question it was really nice talking to you and mm -hmm. where can people find you online and what's the best way to reach out to you sure i am very active on social media so they can 
reach out to me by my author page or my art page, AJ Gurler Art or AJ Gurler Author um, is my Instagram handle. And also on I'm on Twitter with AJ Gurler Art again. But my website is the best place to reach out to me, my name and last name.com, www.ajagurlar.com. There's a contact page there. You can fill out just a little part there and just like send any email that you want to me. And also my email address is contact at ajagurlar.com if they're interested. And YouTube too, if you are interested in art, definitely follow me uh, on YouTube, ajagurlar art. I will make sure that uh, I leave all of the links on the show notes so that people can actually read them as well. Oh, perfect. Now, this is a question that I ask everyone. It's always the last question of the podcast. And of course, this is a bookish podcast. And I would like to know an all-time favorite book and the book you would recommend right now. Okay, the first question probably people don't like because it's hard to pick your book in I your know, life. Right? Imagine yeah, yeah, yeah. me asking me this from asking this from people. I know. I know. <laughs> so I'll be not it's not gonna be a classic or it's not going to be something uh you would expect, just telling you because oh, I, I'm not really a fan of classics. So oh, okay. I prefer contemporary. Oh so, really? Yeah, okay, oh yeah. Good. I have trouble reading classics for some reason. They just they tend to bore me for some reason. I can listen to them in audiobook. It's true. I can say this because <laughs> it's the <laughs> truth. I can listen to them in audiobook. But for example, I, I remember listening to nine, um, 1984 and there was a bit there in which he talks about some laws. And I, I was thinking if I had to read this, I would just, as we say in Portuguese, read it diagonally because I would not read this properly because <laughs> I don't have patience for so much information that doesn't seem to add a lot to the story to me personally. So That's classics, very true actually about yeah. 1984 I you I there was a big chunk of a letter there that I yeah had to skip <laughs> and I love the book like I really love the book but that part I was like yeah I'm glad I, I got the audiobook and yeah with classics I tend to give up on them because of that because mm. somehow they just they just don't get caught my attention so mm. I prefer contemporary. So you can choose whatever, like really okay. just a yeah, book yeah, that yeah. says something to you, even if it's not like the most beautiful book you've ever read, but just something that says something to you. Sure. Um, although I write fiction, I'm a huge fan of nonfiction because I love learning about um, different things. So I think I would say Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari was yeah. a very, I think it broke many grounds for me and I really changed my thinking after that book which is very rare you know people don't change <laughs> their thinking after a book usually they start questioning things but they don't change but I did so I think that was I read it three times so I think that oh, wow. is something <laughs> like yeah, did this... I miss a line <laughs> I want to go back and read it but again. I also think it's a book that you need to read more than once there are a couple of books of nonfiction that you mm -hmm. do have to read them more because it's so much information even if it's like a short story of yes. humanity it's a yes. lot of information to retain in one one read yeah. i think and sapiens had like this um con collection of history uh, anthropology um and futuristic and also psychology everything was, that i am interested in was in one book that's what mm -hmm. i really really enjoyed it i think yeah and the book you would recommend right now? I, I'm currently reading, and I'm going to recommend one more book. I'm currently reading uh, Missing Colors by Lana Ondorf. She's uh, my friend, and she just published a book as well, and I'm reading it, and I'm loving it, so I highly recommend. Uh, but I recommend also Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the best. <laughs> <laughs> sorry it really touches upon the race issue in a very very sincere way and also a relationship with family and he's so funny one moment you laugh and the the other moment you cry and I was like this is a roller coaster <laughs> Just like I found the best about that book is that he is capable of making you laugh about absolutely terrible things. Like he's telling you something that is really terrible. It's like it's the worst. And yet you're just crying laughter, la laughing. Exactly. Exactly. I know. 
I and I know exactly what you're thinking right now. Who the yeah. <laughs> yes, that part with his uh, friends uh, dancing, yeah, which yeah, you yeah. kind of which is great because it builds up. You see it building up. You're like he hasn't even finished the scene describing the scene, and this is of course the scene where when, when they are at the Jewish uh, Jewish oh can't say Jewish today Jewish school, and uh-huh. his friend is called Hitler. And you see it like happening as he is telling, even before he finishes, you're already, oh my exactly. God, oh my yeah. God. <laughs> yeah, but many other c- scenes with his mother as well and in dangerous situations. Yeah, that was situations. very touching. Yeah, and very realistic as well. I felt like I was in the moment and I could see what was going through his mind. Mm-hmm. I think, although it's not uh, astonishing the written book I would say it's just very real and sincere book and it never bores you and you want to know more and more I felt like I was born there and I was kind of going through you know him him and his grandma like all those stories that made yep. me really laugh so I think that was and I found something about my childhood too because it's just very similar we were like an average family uh, so mi- middle class family so it was it was interesting. I was just a bit, I would, it's not disappointed, but I thought he was going to talk more about um, his career, like what happened after he got his, like his career as a comedian and etc. But he right. did not. He kind of stopped at the beginning of his uh, uh, right. Career. I think he did it on purpose. I think uh, he wanted attention to stay on the mother issue yeah. and then he just like dropped it there. That's how I felt because yeah. I was like, so and then he's like oh and i'm on the united states bye-bye and i'm yeah. like <laughs> i was like wait a minute you're you're not finished man <laughs> yeah i know how did you how did you go there from south africa what happened yeah and there was that but i i kind of hope i i want but i hope that he um he puts out a new book a new biography talking about that but yeah like you said he did give focus to his life and how he was born because it's called born a crime so mm-hmm. um, it was more to his life. But yeah, it was definitely one. I've listened to, to it as an audiobook and it was really good. Read by him. Yeah. Yeah. Very I good. I tell you're into audiobooks a lot. I... Oh, I love audiobooks. It's like, <laughs> I don't know if you listen to audiobooks. No, I have not. Yeah. But I, uh, I have a friend who actually, I she heard me talking about audiobooks on Facebook and how much I love them. And she, she paints, but she never managed to focus um, to listen an audiobook while she was sitting for example but then she started to listen to audiobooks while painting and she Mm -hmm. says now I can read like quite a few audiobooks a week while I'm painting because I just put the audiobook to to play like on my headphones or something while I'm doing my art so um, for me it was very happy I was very happy about it because I also started listening to audiobooks Um, I think was actually when I started running which I don't anymore I gave up running after a few weeks, but um, it it helped um, focus on something hel- of something else while I was running. And before that, I was actually reading, um, listening to radio, drama and comedy. So it it became easier for me to kind of ah. leap to audiobooks because comedy and drama has more voices, so it's easier for you to focus. So when you leap to audiobooks, you're e- you're more used to listen to people even when Mm. it's just one voice and I like I cycle to work every day one hour so 30 minutes each way and I can like I just listen to audiobooks and it just makes it so enjoyable I love audiobooks I will never stop talking about my love for audiobooks I was gonna say I think my point was kind of hesitant point of hesitance was like is it one person's single voice and what if I don't like their accent or what if I don't like their voice or how they tell this story and you know, is, is is it like, for example, also, is it British English, American English, like how? And uh, I think there's only single voice reading the book, right? It's not. Yeah, the- well, depends. Yeah. There are a full cast of ah. books sometimes. Yeah, like, for example, I think you have for Agatha Christie, Sherlock Holmes, etc. other books that you have a full cast reading. And for example, Neil Gaiman has a few um, of his books. I love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. So, and he's got a few of his books turned into um, radio dramas from BBC Radio Four, like um, what, uh, New Omens that he wrote with Terry Pratchett, um, and Nancy Boys, I think, was uh, Stardust. There's another one that I forgot, but he's got quite a few, and then it's a whole cast. 
And they're not reading the book. They're actually acting out the books. But then when you want to read the book, for example, it's a lot easier because you know the story acted out and you go to to the book. Uh, Oh, the other one is Neverwhere. And it's all it's with James McAvoy, McAvoy and Benedict Cumberbatch is really good. But I yeah, you kind of learn to get used to it, I think. Of course, it's not the same for everyone. Some people can't really focus on it. But I have a friend, for example, that she has HD, uh, ADHD mm-hmm. and she has trouble reading, sitting to read, to read. So she listens to audiobooks. Because it's her way to listen to audiobooks and to be able to read a book. But if you don't like, for example, you have samples. If you go to Libre FM, Libre FM, they support indie bookstores. So if you're going to buy um, an audiobook or to try out, um, I would advise Libre FM. They give you a month free as well. So one oh. credit that you can buy, uh, you can buy an audiobook. And they, they always, the audiobooks always have samples. So if you listen to the audiobook and you don't like the voice, if you listen to those four minutes and you don't like the voice, you can choose another audiobook. It's um, it's always a possibility, and you will find you'll find many nice ones that you like. Uh, I think. It, yeah, I usually I have two. I have one that is Libre FM, and then the other is Storytel. But Storytel, it's different. Storytel is a little bit like Netflix for books. So you pay uh, an amount every month and then they have a certain selection of books, which is pretty good. They have Mm. a lot of books available. And then Libre FM, you pay $15 each month and you can buy one book with that credit. Like, for example, the Obama book, I don't think because I don't really read nonfiction very Uh well, but I love listening to nonfiction. So audiobooks are great for nonfiction. Oh, okay. And you just try it out and you see if you like it. And yeah, so there I'm isn't a... a lot to lose. Yeah, I know. I No, no, no. Definitely. I should try. Now I you hope you'll give it a me. try. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm all for audiobooks. So, And nobody come at me and say that audiobooks aren't the same as reading. I will fight you. Because <laughs> that's an ableist idea. Because like I said, some people cannot read books for whatever reason. And the story is there you just get the story in your mind anyway so definitely go I will try books. I'll give it a try this was already like the interview was great thank you so much for being on the podcast but like just the fact that I'm convincing you to listen to your book it's just great <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much you oh, know thank you it was a great interview you ask so many questions that I've never been asked before, which kind of reveals, I think, the whole backstory of my book and art business. Thank you so much. No, was- you're very welcome. Thank you for uh, for wanting to be a part of it and super interesting life story as well. Thank you. Thank you. You can access all of today's show's notes via my pod page, which you can find along with all of my social media links at linktree slash Karina Pereira. I'd also like to give a shout out to Libre FM, which has been a great support for my podcast and Instagram account with their Advanced Listening Coffees program. And I'm happy to announce that I have a brand new special offer for listeners. By becoming a new Libre FM member, you can get two audiobooks for the price of one, which is $14.99, with your first month of membership. All you need to do is use the code A Story of Sorts at checkout. That's A Story of Sorts, all small letters and all together. Libre FM has more than 215,000 audiobooks available, including bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. When you purchase audiobooks from Libre FM, you are supporting independent bookstores and the whole community. This offer is for now only available in the US and Canada. Hopefully, Libre FM will be able to reach Europe with all these offers soon. You can use Libre FM anywhere in the world. As you have listened today, I love audiobooks. I will always share my love for audiobooks with others. And I particularly love the way Libre FM works and how they do so much more than just selling audiobooks. They use their platform in amazing ways, so check them out. If you have enjoyed this episode, don't forget to leave a review and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. For regular updates on what I'm reading, follow my Instagram page at a story of sorts. I'll be back with a new episode on the 2nd of February, this time with Esme the Here, with some tips on how to start your own book club, including online. I'll talk to you then, and thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.